Now, as you mentioned, I want to talk about the acceleration trap. Around the globe and in these countries, companies are facing increasing levels of uh, market pressure and competition. So if companies want to have a chance to survive and succeed in this world, they need to become faster and better, whether they like it or not. And that means that they have to introduce new management technologies. They have to raise performance goals, shorten innovation cycles, increase the number and speed of their activities, and make organizational systems more efficient. <coughs> Essentially, what they have to do is they have to get more work done with fewer people at higher quality in less time, right? Well, at least some of you are nodding. <laughs> it's the stuff that I hear from managers and leaders. But I disagree. I think companies run into more trouble than they resolve if they go into high-speed mode for the long run. Of course, it helps to shift up gears for a little while. But making this furious pace the new normal doesn't work. Of course, we all enjoy the momentum that comes with high energy phases, the bursts of achievement that come with them. But if you are asked as an employee to exert the same amount of effort day after day, month after month, well, eventually, then your motivation will sap and performance will suffer. Now, that's the phenomenon that I call the acceleration trap. It is when companies take on more than they can handle. And it is an epidemic of our time. In fact, in a recent research study I conducted with nearly 100 companies, more than half of them actually suffered from the acceleration trap. Now, interestingly, the managers in those companies noticed that something was amiss. Where had all the enthusiasm, all the excitement gone? But then they misinterpreted the lack of energy as a sign of laziness, unjustified protest or so. And thus, instead of giving their employees a little bit of air to breathe, some time to recharge, they exerted more pressure. Work harder, work faster, produce better results. Now, guys, that only adds insult to injury and it drives the company even further into the acceleration trap. So, ironically, the permanent calls for high performance have the opposite effect. They make us tired and exhausted, and they bring the performance of companies down. Now, that's been the bad news. The good news is that companies can actually extract themselves out of the acceleration trap, they can escape it, and there are ways in which companies can maintain high performance, even in the long run, without overtaxing their employees. And I'll devote the rest of my talk on these good news. So I'll tell you how to recognize the acceleration trap, I'll tell you how to get out of it, and I'll also tell you how to establish a culture that prevents future entrapment. Now, when Trying to recognize the acceleration trap, we have to know that there are three different patterns. The first one is overloading. That's simply when organizations try to do too much. They ask that their employees do too much. Often that's the result of remarkable success, of exceptional growth. And the easy solution here would be to just hire more employees so that you can distribute the work onto more shoulders. However, oftentimes that's not feasible, and sometimes it even creates more problems because it introduces complexity, and more people sometimes create more work. Now, the second pattern is called multi-loading, and that's when organizations try to do too many things, and employees don't know actually what to really do. They have all sorts of stuff to do, but there is no focus, and in fact, this is resulting from a lack in strategic focus of the entire company, and unclear priorities. It's sometimes a consequence of mergers and acquisitions when it's unclear where the entire business is now going. And the next and third and last pattern is perpetual loading. 
That's simply when there is no end in sight. When the employees are deprived of any hope that there will ever be a time when they'll get a chance to re regenerate and recover. That can be found in many organizations that go from one crisis to the next, or from the, in those organizations that value face time more than they value results. <coughs> now, if a company is caught in the acceleration trap, be it through overloading, multi-loading, or perpetual loading, or any combination of these three, uh, then the company can extract itself out of the acceleration trap through a couple of ways. The most effective one, I believe, is if they start a so-called stop the action initiative. Now, most companies have idea suggestion schemes. These idea suggestion schemes allow employees to submit ideas for stuff that the company should be doing in addition to what it already does. And a stop the action initiative turns that principle around. It asks employees for what the company should terminate, what activities could be stopped. So just ask your employees, what kind of activities would we start doing now if they weren't already underway? And then eliminate all others. Now that frees up massive capacity, and employees love to do it. But there are, in fact, two challenges that are inherent in Stop the Action initiatives. The first is that when it comes to your own projects, employees are sometimes a little hesitant, and they have difficulty understanding which of those might be more important than the other. Um, so they believe everything is important. An example of that happened at Phoenix Contact, a company that produces technology in Germany. And the vice president uh, there, Gunther Olisch, tried to, got a sense that there was overloading in the business and tried to do a stop the action initiative. So he said, well, let's categorize all our current and future projects into A, B, and C project so that we could put the less important ones on hold, at least for a little while. Now, the employees came back and said, well, we only have A projects. There was a difficulty and determining what was important and what wasn't. But Gunther Olesch actually forced it through because he was afraid that if he doesn't cut the workload, that the entire company might collectively burn out. So he said, no, 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 no. If there are only A projects, then make it A1, A2, and A3. <laughs> there we go. So the message here is people need to be able to prioritize. But they can only do so if the leadership of the organization actually provides a clear strategy if there is orientation and guidance for employees as to how they make such decisions. Unless there is a clear strategy in the business, unless the senior executives have given you some guidance, there is no way employees can make such decisions. The other challenge inherent in Stop the Action initiatives is that we have learned from very early on that unless you finish something, we have failed at it. Now that leads people to continue projects forever and ever and ever and ever, even if they already know these projects are doomed and they go nowhere. So how do businesses deal with the potential disappointment and shame that people could feel if they have to stop projects in which they've invested so much effort already, but they are actually hopeless? Well, it turns out there are some businesses who resolve that problem very creatively. Um, indeed, I have seen businesses running, uh, holding burials for failed projects. Now, <laughs> that sounds rather extreme, but if you think through it, it is a time where we thank people, where we uh, grieve, and where we let go to then start over. And in fact, if you go to the ice cream factory of Ben & Jerry's in Vermont, you find that in their backyard, there's a graveyard where all the flavors are buried that they've stopped producing. <laughs> I don't expect all businesses to now uh, put a uh, graveyard into their backyard, <laughs> but you have to get the message behind this, and that is that each company, each business, has to find a way of dealing with the employees' emotions effectively so that they can stop projects with dignity, so that they stop the overloading of people. Now, if you've gone through these Stop the Action initiatives, now the task is to secure your company and make sure that it doesn't fall into that acceleration trap again. And here I tell companies a couple of things. The first thing is make the Stop the Action Initiative a regular exercise. Some actually call it spring cleaning. They do it every year. 
no matter what you call it. As long as you regularly clean up your company and get rid of all the overload, that's helpful. Second thing is, be very careful when people want to start new projects. Steve Jobs, CEO of, of Apple, once said that Apple's innovation came from saying now, no to a thousand things, and thus making sure that the company wasn't taking on too much or getting in on the wrong track. At the very least, in your project management system, when someone wants to do a new project, ask them first, which project are you going to stop to make room for the new one? Also, give people timeouts. Give them one or two days during a certain amount of time in which they have time to reflect and think whether what they're doing is actually the right thing to do. Also, try to alternate high energy phases with low energy phases so that you can enjoy the spirit that's inherent in when everybody's working hard and long hours, but you also plan in the time to recover from those intense periods afterwards. The fashion industry has done this for many years with two fashion shows going into high speed mode to prepare them, celebrating, <coughs> calming down, rescuing, and then going back up. There is no reason why other businesses can't do that. In fact, the Swiss uh, producer of hearing aids, Sonova, does the same thing. Hearing aids are different from clothes, I'm sure you all agree. But he actually just reduces the release dates of new products to, tw to a year. And they all go into high speed mode to release, and then they relax, and then they recover, and then they go back into high speed mode. Such rhythms help a lot more than a flat out nine to five. Now, I should also say that you should include in your feedback system not only questions about how well people perform, but you should also include in the feedback system questions about how well they recover and recharge. If companies actually appraise you on those terms, certainly people will take care, better, better care of themselves. And finally, we need role models who display that you can combine high performance with time to gain more energy. In fact, Bill Gates, CEO of Microsoft at a uh, time ago, uh, used to go to his beach cottage and retreat there for what he called a think week. During that time, he was cut off of the daily communication and the day-to-day -day business. But he selected the ideas that Microsoft should be pursuing in the future. In fact, the Xbox was selected at the time in one of these think weeks. So he's doing one of the most essential things for the business, but at the same time, he's doing it at the beach cottage where he has time to recover and is not involved in a day-to-day -day business. Nowadays, dozens of Microsoft big thinkers do that, and so Bill Gates has been a role model for them. So in sum, when everybody else is speeding up, it's best to slow down and to think how to best allocate your resources. If companies try to take on more than they can handle, they fail. But if they dare to focus and find the right balance between high energy phases and low energy phases, then they're likely to be high performers in the long run. Thank you.